I, I begin by saying, um, whatever your criticism of NATO, that its time has ended with the end of the Cold War, it's over, that it's wasted pursuing non-military aims such as fighting climate change, that it allows rich European countries to free ride on US defense spending, all of those things, and I agree with some of the criticisms, you have to concede that NATO overall has been a success. It was a resounding success in the years 1949 to 89 when it achieved the highly ambitious objectives that its signatory set it uh, at the foundation. In the famous words of the UK's Lord Ismay, it was founded to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Well, NATO did rather better than that. It drove the Russians out. It enabled the Germans to return to respectable democratic nationhood and joined the alliance militarily, as well as politically, within a decade of 1945. And it gave the United States a secure, legitimate, and leading position as a European power in its own right. The US, through NATO, did more than help Europe defend itself in the 40 years. Its powerful presence meant that no country in Western Europe felt insecure in relation to its neighbors. The US would not allow a serious conflict to break out because that would complicate its defense against the Warsaw Pact. Two large developments flowed from that. First, the 30 glorious years of European growth and prosperity that contributed to winning the Cold War. Secondly, the secure peace in Europe that enabled the creation of the European Union. The EU itself likes to present that as, as the, present itself as the creator of that peace. But look at the dates. Um, the EU was founded in 1956-57. Um, the uh, European peace it protected started in 1949. Uh, the EU is in reality the child of that European peace. And given the fractious disputes within the EU today and the occasional suggestions from Paris and Brussels that it should become an empire, we can't necessarily be confident that peace would survive if the US were to leave. Second, the other big development is if that covers, if that covers the 40 years of the Cold War, what of the post-Cold War world from 1989 to well, maybe today, maybe 2008, maybe 2014. Um, in the immediate, did the value of NATO disappear in the years after 1989? My answer is no. Um, it, we in the West, in the immediate aftermath of the Velvet Revolutions of 89 and 91, we in the West were far from optimistic about the newly liberated post-Soviet satellites. We knew that they had ruined economies, collapsed party states without democratic institutions and social attitudes that had been frozen in the past by Soviet rule. We feared the return of such evils as anti-Semitism, authoritarianism, border disputes, and ethnic warfare as the Soviet refrigerator broke down and unfroze those things. It was, however, NATO expansion. And this is not in the history books, but the EU lagged behind NATO on this matter. It was NATO expansion that insisted not only on the reform of the militaries in those states to meet NATO standards, but also on the reform of their economic and political institutions to meet the standards of modern market democracies. For the people in those countries, it was a hard struggle to adapt those to those standards. But they did, some better, some worse at the time. But 30 years later, today, the old Soviet satellites are a zone of prosperity and stability. And we see today the paradox that at least in relation to anti-Semitism, Hungary and Poland are in a position to criticize France, Britain, and Germany for their failure to offer sufficient protection to their Jewish citizens. That's a tribute to the countries of the region, of course. But the way that they move towards this success under the encouragement and mentorship of NATO is a tremendous achievement for the Western institutions, NATO particularly, um, that ensured it happened, and in general for Western civilization that welcomed back its captive nations. I would also claim that properly considered, this was a benefit to Russia too. 
because it removed any serious possibility that NATO's new members would in any way threaten or undermine Russia because NATO and the US would simply never tolerate that. Are these achievements of NATO's expansion negated or counterbalanced because it also provoked Russia to invade Georgia in 2008 and Ukraine in 2014 and 2024? I should acknowledge I have an interest, uh, an intellectual interest, not a financial one, in the expansion of NATO. In the, 18, in the 1990s, I founded an organization called, uh, with others here today like Chris Muth, called uh, the New Atlantic Initiative, dedicated to bringing the countries of Central and Eastern Europe into the institutions of Atlantic cooperation, NATO and the EU. I don't want to exaggerate the importance of the NAI. Um, uh, others were working in the same vineyard, like the Committee to Enlarge NATO. But we brought together a bipartisan coalition of statesmen on both sides of the former Iron Curtain, including Vaclav Havel, Margaret Thatcher, Henry Kissinger, Helmut Schmidt, and George Shultz to make the case for expansion. And we helped to persuade the Congress and two administrations to support it. It duly went through in two stages, 1998 and 2004. So, I mean, there's no way I can pretend to be neutral on this. Uh, I stand where I stood. To answer, therefore, the argument that NATO expansion provoked Russia, let me remind you that the push for both NATO and EU expansion did not come from Washington, Brussels, Paris, or London. Quite the contrary. Those countries, the French in particular, were leery of it. It was the newly independent satellites themselves that pushed strongly for it against initial Western hesitation. They wanted the various economic and other benefits, of course, but their overriding reason for wanting to join the West militarily as well as economically was that they feared Russian revanchism and they wanted protection against it. It was as simple as that. And who is to say now that they were wrong? Less than 10 years after NATO's expansion in 1998, Russia in 2008 um, um, moved troops next to Georgia, then into it, then occupying it, and still occupying it. At that time, 23 leading Central and East European political and intellectual leaders wrote to President Obama asking him for a declaration of support for them and, res and of resistance to this breach of international law. All they received from Obama was that he sent Joe Biden to make a series of soft soap speeches to them. That told Russia, not that NATO and the US were peaceful and thus neither enemies nor threats, but merely that they were risk averse and therefore could be challenged with greater impunity. Since then, Russia's foreign policy has been one of gradualist moves to recover former Soviet territory as soon as the West's indignation at a particular Russian action had quietened down. Six years after 2008, the Kremlin moved tentatively against Ukraine in 2014 and abandoned caution altogether in February 2022, which brings us, of course, to the present Ukraine war crisis. If you're disposed to reject this view of the Central Europeans that they needed defense against a revanchist Russia, then you probably consider Russia not to be a revanchist power. And I believe Dr. Maitre takes something like that view, and I look forward to hearing what he, uh, what he says. I should add that I sympathize, I sympathize largely with his views on rebalancing NATO in order to enable the US to concentrate more on threats from China. Against the view, that Russia is not revanchist, let me suggest the following considerations. Before Russia invaded Ukraine fully in 2022, President Putin sent letters demanding a rewriting of the, post of the Cold War settlement that would compel Hungary, Poland, and other states to withdraw from effective military participation in NATO. He sent that letter to the US president and to the NATO and to the uh, Secretary General of NATO. He didn't address these letters to the governments of any of the European countries that would be impacted by his demand. That smacks of the neo-imperialist greater Russian mindset that is the underlying reason for the na its neighbor's fear of future aggression. In the 1990s, Bill Clinton was surprised to be asked by Russian President Yeltsin, why don't we simply agree 
um, that Russia can have Europe while the US gets the rest of the world. Clinton rejected this offer, which incidentally is reminiscent of Hitler's peace offer to Britain in 1940. But it worried him that such an offer had been made in the first place. It casts a somber light backwards on Gorbachev's stress on the long-standing proposal of our common European home addressed to Western Europe and implying the withdrawal of the United States from Europe and the end of NATO um, and, of, and, and, and of transatlantic relations. Putin has, of course, made that same point himself, together with even more tendentious arguments in his notorious justification of the Nazi-Soviet pact. But who threatened Russia in 1939? Not the Western democracies. They wanted the Soviet Union as an ally against Nazi Germany, although Poland and other states objected because they doubted the Russians would actually withdraw um, uh, when asked. Neither Britain nor France had any intention of invading Soviet Russia in the late 1930s. That alone would justify a non-aggression pact between the two totalitarian powers. Besides, the Nazi-Soviet pact was not a non-aggression pact. It, Stalin's Russia and Hitler's Germany agreed to divide, invade and divide Poland between them and to give Finland and the Baltics to the Soviets. It was, therefore, an aggression pact, which should concern us. After 1945, the Russians did refuse to withdraw the Red Army from Eastern Europe, as its peoples had feared. Again, that might have been justified in the case of Hungary, which had been a reluctant ally of Germany, but not in the case of allies like Poland and Czechoslovakia. As the local joke goes, the Soviets gave to Poland and the Czechs as a gift what it gave to the Hungarians as a punishment and the Red Army stay for the next 40 years. Andre, fifth, fifth point here, Andre Ilyanarov, who was Putin's economic advisor for several years, a very successful one at that, has on several occasions testified that the Russian president has a well worked out long term strategy to divide, Europe, to divide Europe from America and the UK, to reach a Rapallo like relationship with Germany and France, and subsequently to wage a long campaign of subversion. Um, uh, to weaken the Anglosphere powers. Without Ukraine and Belarus, such a campaign would be a pipe dream because Russia would be reduced to an important regional power and gradually forced by reality to shed its neo-imperialist neo mindset. That makes the outcome of the Ukraine war geopolitically important. It does not detect, it does not detect dictate, I'm sorry, that the West should aim to defeat Russia. In my view, it does dictate the prevention of a Russian victory. And if you find this long list of historical Russian advances unpersuasive, let me draw your attention to Russia's massive program of spending on new armaments. It is surely rule one of realist political thinking that your knowledge of what sinews of war a potential enemy has at his disposal should guide your thinking far more than your guesstimate of what his intentions may be. Because apart from anything else, intentions may change. My conclusion from all these points is that the European continent is at long-term risk from a Russia that has traditionally confused its security with its dominance and control of its neighbors. neighbors. And since however far it advances geographically, it will always have neighbors. So a permanent vigilance and a strong military defense is required of Europeans as long as the Russians remain, uh, retain their political um, outlook. And given the success of NATO over almost 80 years, it makes every sense that NATO should be the vehicle of such defense. That conclusion is now threatened by three considerations. The need for the United States to rebalance its military commitments and spending in order to contain the growing potential threat from China. Two, the delusion that the European Union can and should pursue strategic autonomy, partly in response, but partly in its, for its own sake. Three, the dire straits of the European economies. And four, the results of the recent European, British, and French elections. I think I must skip for time reasons over the last two points, uh, and because others will be dealing with them. Knowing that others will deal with them in detail, I 
will be brisk in dealing with them here, and I will confine myself to what I think really matters in each case. On America, it is inevitable that an America that is now, if anything, too aware of China's challenge, having, igno having ignored it for too long, will move money and troops from Europe to combat it. What matters is how much money and how many troops. I would say that the US must obviously keep its nuclear umbrella over the continent uh, and commit enough troops and forward supplies to, the, to Europe as to justify its leadership role in NATO. No other power can play that role, and without US leadership, NATO, in my view, will not function well. My guess is that the US commitment will be more than Eldred Colby, Colby uh, or Dr. Mato would like, uh, and less than I would like. But US preeminence as NATO is the key strategic necessity. On the EU's idea of strategic autonomy, this lacks the essential underpinning of a European people and police that would support the military financial commitments needed for this ambitious role. Only last week, the European Council failed to agree on a scheme for EU defense bonds that would finance current levels of spending far smaller than those needed for European strategic autonomy. European NATO members have struggled to reach the 2% spending target. Some have failed to do so. But if America is to do and spend less, then Europe must do and spend more on NATO. Strategic autonomy means diverting either funds from NATO or duplicating NATO functions that already exist. What military activities it has already spawned, like the Rapid Reaction Force, have been embarrassing failures, with governments asking their allies to keep their soldiers in place, uh, other governments asking to keep their soldiers in place in order to avoid having to send the replacements they had agreed to spend. At a time when more defense spending is acutely necessary, it can't be wasted on a political symbol. EU strategic autonomy will be defending not the European continent, but the European idea. We have already sacrificed Mediterranean Europe to the Euro. Do we have to carry on wasting treasure and in time perhaps lives in order to, uh, to affirm symbolic lies? Now, finally, to the nitty gritty of the Ukraine war. I speak here as someone who has been and remains a strong supporter of both NATO expansion and of its support for Ukraine's resistance. But as such, I also recognize the legitimacy of open criticism and debate about the war's progress and about what are realistic and practical war aims. In the recent US election, Nigel Farage, who some claim to be a national conservative, was denounced as a Putin, a Putin stooge because he had argued in 2014 that further NATO expansion would invite a Russian response. And when it did invite a Russian response in 2024, he criticized their actions as reprehensible. That exaggerated condemnation of a reasonable critic risks making any rational debate about Ukraine policy impossible, even to the point of criminalizing it. We have already gone too quite far down that rocky road. When we treat reasonable anxieties about Western policy, are we embarking on another forever war? What outcome short of Ukraine's regaining its full territory, including Crimea, um, do we envisage? We, when we treat these things as some variant of in disinformation intended to subvert democracy and help the Russians. That's neither sensible nor justified. I um, believe we have persuasive answers to such anxieties. I've l I have um, laid them out elsewhere. But in war anyway, arguments must come second to events in the field. Any argument about Ukraine policy has to take into account the success or failure um, uh, on the of Ukraine on the battlefield and of NATO and the EU in other areas. Uh, and, sorry, one final page here. Uh, and, in all, and as in all aspects of human nature, we must tailor what we want to match what we can achieve. I'm not likely to be given the responsibility to make those decisions, but let's consider some possibility. Would I like to see Ukraine enter NATO? If that is what the Ukrainians want, yes. Um, 
Is Ukrainian membership of NATO a strategic necessity for us uh, as uh, under the principles I outlined above? Not really. Those principles require that Ukraine be enabled to retain real independence and to obtain the military hardware and economic assistance it needs to protect that independence. That would deprive Russia of Ukraine and render it less of a threat to Europe, which is the aim of this particular game. But is even that aim practical if we make the assumption, now quite general but far from certain, that Russia must, event Russia must eventually defeat Ukraine? My answer is as follows. Russia might be capable of defeating Ukraine if given long enough, or even more quickly, if Ukraine were abandoned by NATO. But it's even clearer that Russia could never win a conventional war against NATO and would sensibly avoid fighting uh, a nuclear war for Ukraine. And the second reality there is greater than the first. So, and this is really into the completely unrespectable area of counterfactual current policy, politics, let me throw in the X factor. Not Elon Musk, but Donald Trump. Donald Trump would not be my favorite candidate for the president, um, um, but he is a figure of great some interest. If we assume a Trump presidency, I think we can also assume, um, given the reality of Trump's personality, that his desire to end the war would be at the very least matched by his determination not to suffer a defeat that would be his defeat down the years. And he would have at his disposal not only the reality of NATO military superiority over Russia, but also the economic reality that he could inflict a massive blow on the Russian economy simply by freeing up the American energy market and letting the oil gush forth, reducing the oil price. My guess is that when Trump and Putin, Putin emerge from their private discussions, they would have reached an astonishingly amicable compromise but it would be a compromise rooted in the existence and the importance of NATO. Thank you.